Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, or good morning, depending on when you're watching. It is your girl, Marcy Thomas, founder of Brown Girl Collective and the BGC Book Club, where, as you can see, we believe in celebrating books by, for, and about Black women. And tonight's book is no exception. I really cannot wait to get into it because I had an exciting time reading it and really engaging with the characters and the story. And I really want to hear about why the author wrote it and all those other wonderful things. So if this is your first time here, I am coming to you live from the outskirts of ATL, originally from Cleveland, Ohio. So while you're here, if you want to drop where you're from, that would be great, just so we know all who is in the room with us. And also, if you have friends or family members who love to read, please feel free to share this out because it's great for people to hear more about some of the books that are on the horizon because actually this week we're going to be talking about something that doesn't come out until next week, depending on when you're watching this. So we are getting an advanced, exciting preview of this wonderful book, which is The House of Plain Truth. And our author this evening is Donna Hemans, who is the author of two previous novels, River Woman and Tea by the Sea, which won the Ling Lignum Vitae Una Marson Award. Try to say that four times fast. Her short fiction and essays have appeared in Electric Literature, Ms. Magazine, and Crab Orchard Review, among others. She also owns the DC Writers Room, a co-working studio for writers based in Washington, DC, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Born in Jamaica, she currently lives in Maryland and received her undergraduate degree in English and Media Studies from Fordham University and an MFA from American University. So without further delay, let's welcome Donna to the room. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure oh, yeah. to be here. Yes, it is indeed a pleasure. And thank you for making us one of the first ones that you actually talked to about your new book. So that's pretty exciting. Absolutely. So how are you feeling one week out? <laughs> um, I'm still calm. I still have all my hair or some of it. <laughs> It's feeling pretty good. It's, um, you know, I think when you work on a project for a long time, you, you're ready to um, right. release it. And I think I'm there. Right, right. So, of course, we're going to get into what the House of Plain Truth is all about. But one of the things I did read um, in preparing is that you actually have been working on this particular story for quite a while. Indeed, yeah. It, I actually started writing it in about 2006, 2007 and um, wrote multiple versions of it, wasn't 100% happy with the story as I was writing it. And so it just took some time for me to get to a place where I felt like this is the story that I wanted to tell, and this is the best way to tell it. Um, you know, it happens sometimes, but um, here we are. All right, and that's, that's wonderful. We're so glad that you did it. So of course, since the book isn't out yet, we know that oftentimes you have early readers. So there may be a few people who join who've already had the opportunity to, to read it. But for those who have not, tell us a little bit, just a snippet of what The House of Plain Truth is actually about. Um, so it's a story about family secrets, which are um, basically triggered when Pearlene decides to give up her life in Brooklyn and move back to Jamaica to help take care of her um, her sick father. And um, on his deathbed, he makes two requests of her. One is to find her siblings who had been left behind in Cuba 60 years earlier. And the second is to be his memory. And so she has to figure out how these two things are related and whether or not she can find her siblings. Wow. And it's such a fascinating story. We'll, we'll get into some of it here as we continue in our conversation. And for those who haven't watched before, if you're looking for spoilers, you're not going to get them because the whole point is to go and grab a copy of the book and read it and, you know, just really dive into actually a very beautifully written story. I don't know if I told you that when we came on, before we came on, but I just really loved the way that the story was written and the imagery and all of those things. Um, but one of the other things I found quite interesting is that there are parts of this story that mirror your own family story. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the story is, um, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't really know about, as, as I have been talking about this book, that's one thing I keep hearing over and over, is that people didn't know that a lot of Jamaicans or people from around the Caribbean migrated to Cuba um, to work. 
And, um, and my grandparents did. They went to Cuba in 1919 and returned to Jamaica in 1931. And so when I was growing up, I knew that little fact. I knew, you know, I'd heard about which aunts and uncles were born in Cuba. My grandmother was pregnant when they were on, when they were on their way back to Jamaica. And so one uncle was born almost immediately after they got back. So I knew those little details, but the nitty gritty details about what their experience was actually like in Cuba, that I didn't know. And so by the time I you know, got to an age where I wanted to try to understand a lot more of it, my grandparents were already dead. Mm. Um, and so I had to try to figure out for myself what that was like. And you know, as a writer, I guess the best way to do it is to write a book. Mm. Um, because you know, I'm doing all of that research, I need to put it to good use. And, um, and so that's really where the story came from. I wanted to sort of try to give my grandparents a story or at the very least understand what their experience was like. Mm -hmm. So what was it, because since that is something that was actually happening, what was it historically that led people from Jamaica to go to Cuba to, you know, to, to live and to work and things like that? Well, a large part of it was um, the Panama Canal was coming to an end. And a lot of Jamaicans um, and a lot of people from across the English-speaking Caribbean had gone to Panama to help build the canal. And, um, you know, so once work there dried up, they had to find new places to go. Um, so that was one thing. Um, the wages in Jamaica at that time were not necessarily very high. Mm -hmm. A lot of American companies were also moving into Cuba to um, operate a lot of the sugarcane factories and um, there. And they needed people to cut cane and to help with the production. So of course, they turned to the, the labor force returning from Panama and other people throughout the Caribbean. Um, you know, so, you know, a lot of things had happened around that time um, as well. You know, there had been, you know, a couple of wars in Cuba um, you know, like a number of different things. They had rules about who could migrate to Cuba. And of mm -hmm. course, you know, certainly not black people. They did not want us there. They were, imp you know, bringing in a lot of migrants from Spain to lighten the, um, the complexion of the country. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so, so there was a lot going on. Um, so at that point, you know, in order to allow this workforce to come in, they had to change the laws of the country to allow them to come in. And of course, you know, once you start doing something like that, it creates a lot of friction. Um, mm -hmm. So there was. Right. And as you were saying that, and actually, as, as I was finishing up the book, it also made me think about um, caste or, you know, it's now our origin and how certain people were put into certain um, cast, you know, certain people were thought of, you know, well, you're on this level because of what you look like or because of where you're from and things like that. And so I, I could see how this was playing out at that time in, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, I, as I started doing the research and, and um, figuring things out and learning that, you know, certainly in Cuba, they were creating different, um, um, how do I say this? They were looking at people coming in from different countries and putting them in different categories. So Jamaicans and people from the English speaking category were um, given more preference than people from Haiti. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there were a lot of attempts to expel the migrants who had been invited in. And most of the times the ones who were expelled first were people who had been, who had come in from Haiti. So there, there was a lot even there within, you know, looking at people who all look the same, where mm -hmm. they were looking at, you know, whether it was your language or what they thought of as your, your education level to use that to determine whether you could stay or not. Um, mm -hmm. Some of it are things that, you know, we can't really understand because it doesn't make sense to us. But, you know, it's, this is what, you know, like so many people went through. Um, in a country that had invited them to come in and work. Wow. I mean, we could go so much deeper into that. <laughs> Just the whole fact, you know, think of even being here in the United States. and yeah. Nothing being, has changed. Nothing has changed. <laughs> yeah, nothing has really changed. 
So I know you said it took you a while to write the story and that you really wanted to give your grandparents a story because it took, you know, several years. If you're talking 2006, 2007 to now, you know, 2024 that it's coming out, probably finished 2022, 23, I would think. That's a long time for something to stick with you. So what was it that made um, Perlene's story and the story of this family really just kind of resonate with you that you couldn't let go of it, even though you did some other things in between? Yeah, I think it really was, it was the fact that it was giving my grandparents a story that I think was driving me to write this. Um, and and I like Perlene. I, you know, like I really like that story and I I, I knew I could do it. It was just a matter of getting to the right place and the right way to tell it. So, you know, I, I think there are some writers who will have a project that they don't quite figure out. They'll put it in a drawer and they'll never return to it. Um, I am not that kind of a writer. I don't like to throw things away, at least not my writing. So it will sit until I figure out how to tell it and tell it properly. And that was the case with this one. It, it just needed it needed me to be, I think, a little bit older and a mm -hmm. different person in order to tell that story. Um, and what I'll say is that in the initial drafts of it, I was trying to tell the story through the perspective of um, Perlene's 18-year-old great-granddaughter. I mean, not great-granddaughter, her grandniece, I think it was at oh. that point. Um, so this young woman really had no life of her own. She didn't mm -hmm. know anything. And she couldn't tell this woman's story. Right. And so, you know, I think with each version that I wrote and rewrote and revised, I kept trying to tell it through that story. And it wasn't until I just started writing a piece about another woman who moved back to Jamaica mm -hmm. that I realized that this was Perlene and she was telling her own story. And I think once I got to that point, it made sense. You know, the story fell into place because I was using the right person to tell the story. So it's it's the same story. It's just I just needed to be a different person. Got it from a different point of view. Right. And and I love that. And I understand you now saying the part about being older to really like to understand what a woman who might be at a different stage of life would feel versus a young girl. Because um, I'm actually I have a mentee who wants to go into film, and I was asking her, well, "What do you want to you know make films about?" She's like, "I think I need a little more life experience." I'm like, "Well." She understands yes, that, that. You know, Good. that she might have ideas, but to really fully flesh things out that, you know, that experience makes a difference. So I love that you're saying that because when we do meet Perlene, she has, you know, she's uh, um, a mature woman who has, you know, grown up, been in Jamaica, gone to the States, had a whole life in the States and then has decided to return home. And so I found that quite interesting because a lot of times there's this whole center of home in the book. Home is a big thing of kind of figuring out what is home, how how am I going to, you know, about a particular house, but then also what is going to be home to me. Is home this place that I, you know, lived for all of these years and built a life or is home the space, the place where you know, I grew up? Right. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's the problem, and I use problem in quotes of, of you know, like just about every person who has moved from home, whether you're migrating to a different country or you're moving from the south to the north or, you know, like a small um, town to the big city, there is this constant, um, I think most people have this constant struggle of, you know, trying to figure out where they actually belong. Um, and, you know, in Perlene's case, she never felt fully at home in Brooklyn, um, mm -hmm. you know, for various reasons. She's an immigrant and, um, you know, immigrants in general have not necessarily been, have not always been fully welcomed. Um, and, you know, she felt some of that, but also going back to Jamaica after being away for such a long time, she also didn't feel like she fully fit in there. And she was questioning it largely because she had two sisters who remained in Jamaica who we're also questioning whether she should be there or not. So I, I think, you know, there's always some level of and some kind of friction depending on where you are, where you're coming from and where you're moving back to. Um, and in her case, you know, her father has died. There is this house that, you know, she and her sisters now have to figure out what to do with. And 
you know, it pulls back to that idea of, you know, like what is the thing that brings you back home? Mm-hmm. And is it the house? Is it the land? Is it people? You know, there's so many things. Right. And I couldn't help but think about my own family in that uh, my mother usually watches. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about her for a little bit. But she was that person. She's from Georgia, you know, a smaller town in Georgia, you know, went to college, got married, moved up to Ohio. You know, heard me uh, with my father. You heard me mention I'm, um, I'm from Ohio. And then in later years, many years later, she moved back to her hometown. And so just, you know, thinking about what that process would have been for her. She went back, you know, her mother, uh, my grandmother was still alive at the time. So, you know, that's similar to what Perlene was going through. Mm -hmm. And similar to Perlene, my mom had a sister that was kind of like, well, you were gone and da, 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 da. So I could really, you know, relate to that. And, you know, just see what I've seen in my own family. Right. And I can imagine that happens often. Yeah, it. I, I'm sure it does. Um, and sometimes not with good um, results. But, you know, I think to a part of it is that um, there are so many people who migrated from Jamaica. I can talk about Jamaica in particular, in, let's mm-hmm. say the 1940s, 50s, 60s, who went away with the idea that they would be going back home at some point. And they have sort of lived kind of, you know, with their foot in, you know, in both countries, because mm-hmm. that was the idea. I'm going to make my life and then go back home, build this nice big house up on a hill and, you know, live happily ever after. Um, that's what Perlene's father wanted. And that in some ways is what Perlene wanted. But I think the reality for a lot of people is that that just doesn't happen. You know, they dream about it, but, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, they're returning to a place that they don't know, no longer understand, have no friends or family there. And so, you know, there's a lot of friction, you know, in that decision. I shouldn't say friction, a lot of tension in that decision, whether they will be, you know, going back home or not. And and how do you define that place that you, you know, you probably don't fully understand anymore because you have been gone from it there for such a long time. Right. You have to come back and kind of reacclimate yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, things have changed. The community has changed, you know, all of that. So it's really something. But, you know, at the at the heart of this story, of course, is about family (laughs) as well. Just relationships among family. And, you know, there were so many different ones. We've already kind of talked about um, Perlene's um, relationships with her sisters, Aileen and Hermina. And how they they bonded because they were st- they remained there in Jamaica and were kind of well we're taking care of dad and you know we're doing all these things mm-hmm. you know you come in you come back and you have all these expectations or you're trying to tell us what to do and she's like well hey I've been helping you guys out all this time mm-hmm. so I have a say as to what's going on so of course we're right. seeing that dynamic right yeah and it's um I guess in some ways it's just hard because there isn't really much separating them other than the fact that they have lived in different places. Um, You know, they were very close growing up, but two remained and they just remained close. And there are some things that Perlene says at one point that, you know, she just feels left out of their conversations. They're us, you know, it used to be us girls, but now she's no longer a part of that. And, you know, in some ways it's, it's the, you know, it's just growing up, it's growing up and growing old and, you know, like creating new relationships, but it creates a lot of tension for Perlene when she goes back, just trying to figure out how to be a part of this group again. Mm-hmm. And we also see a mother daughter dynamic with her, with her daughter, Josette. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I think I I often write about mother-daughter relationships and, um, you know, I guess it showed up again here because that is something that I do. Um, so, yeah. So Perlene has had a somewhat difficult relationship with her daughter. And I think a lot of it stems from um, the fact that one, she's an only child. She was very close to her father and her father passed away from a heart attack. Um, And I don't want to, you know, give away too much. I don't want to say too much, but there is some friction there because of, you know, like Perlene's work habits. I mean, she worked a lot. 
in order to fulfill this dream that she had when she left Jamaica, and in some ways to fulfill her father's dream. Um, and so I think there are things that she missed out on with her own daughter, and her daughter had, you know, like held, you know, um, against her. So there is that tension there, but um, it's not bad in the end. That's all I'll say. Yeah, we won't say too much. <laughs> we won't say too much. But I just found, well, you said enough that I can say this, put it this mm-hmm. way. That, you know, it just makes me think a lot of times there is this... Um, mythology, which I guess isn't necessarily a mythology about immigrants coming to the United States and working like really, really, really hard. You know, I know you've heard right. of them with 10 jobs. I know you've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nothing. But I mean, it's it's a real thing and not just Jamaicans, even others, because they feel like, you know, coming to the United States is such this land of opportunity mm-hmm. or feel when they come here, but oftentimes it does require to really work hard. And it may mean you have to have two jobs or three jobs mm-hmm. or you know whatever the case may be. So that really felt like what I am accustomed to seeing, you know, in that regard. And then of course you have the child who grew up as an American citizen who has a different take on things. Right. Yeah, there is some truth to it. Um, and, you know, certainly not every immigrant comes and, you know, like has the four or five or 10 jobs. But <laughs> but I, I think there are a lot of people who do it. Um, and I think what, you know, in order to understand it is to really look at how many people they're taking care of back at home. Mm-hmm. And so for some people, depending on where you have grown up or how you have grown up, it's your, your mother, your father, your siblings. Um, they are just... Uh, you know, a hurricane comes and the roof is gone, somebody has to replace that roof or somebody needs medication, somebody needs surgery. You know, there's usually something. Um, And I think there are many people who come and then work those many jobs because they're trying to not just take care of themselves here, build a life for themselves, but really either take care of people who are living or save enough so that they can go back to build this life that they are, you know, they expected to have by migrating. And that's a really important important point that you just brought up because most, you know, Americans who are here in America, we're we're taking care of ourselves, our own households. Mm -hmm. There may be some people who, you know, help out a parent or a child or whatever from time to time, but by and large, it's not a thing where we're like, I really, you know, I need to make, you know, X amount of dollars so I can live here. And of course, being in New York is very expensive. Right. (laughs) Right. And, and still send money home. So that, that is something to think about, you know. That it is, yeah. Family, you know. Right. And Perlene does say that at some point, you know, where she reminds her sisters or she's thinking about it, just how much she had to do to, to help them out. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's not also, it's not to make people feel guilty, but it's, you know, I'm, you know, she's doing a lot and, you know, I, family members are, you know, doing a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we also see in the book, the whole concept of found family, or I call it adopted family. And that's something that we, as you know, people of the African diaspora tend to do. (laughs) Someone will, will come into our lives and we adopt them, you know, as a son, a daughter, you know, niece, nephew, whatever the case may be. And so that we know that family, yes, it's blood, but it also extends beyond that. Right. Yeah. I mean, are, are you talking about Derek? Yes. As he, um, well, yeah, he actually happens to be blood, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, it's a surprise relative because um, she didn't know about this. Um, well, Perlene didn't know that her father had had another child. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, she, um, this um, nephew of hers shows up and she decides to accept him. But I think too, that a lot of her acceptance stems from the idea of, what her mother wanted and what her father wanted that the house in Jamaica or their home be a place from which they could never be removed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think if that is the idea and that is what you're going with, then how can you say no to another relative, whether you knew of him or not? Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of it really stems from this idea that, 
you know, they were turned away once from Cuba and she feels that as a people, you know, they've always been moved. You mm -hmm. know, this is the one thing that you now own um, and it's, it's yours, it's your family's. You should do everything you can to hold on to it and bring everybody in as mm -hmm. opposed to turn in family members away. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I do want to kind of shift a little bit because we're talking, you know, we're talking about her parents. And of course, um, at the time, the parents are speaking to her, <laughs> but they are not in the land of the living. And wow, that was just really deep to read, to think that, you know, people from beyond, mm -hmm. you know, speaking to you and, you know, showing you things or telling you things or leading you in a certain direction. Um, how much of a challenge was it for you to write that part of the story? Or are these things that are just naturally a part of, you know, your own history and background that it was like, oh, this is what, you know, my life has been? Um, I can't say that's what my life has been, but I, um, <laughs> I, you know, it's one of those things where I have so many relatives who, and not just relatives, but you hear people talk all the time about, um, you know, like hearing from somebody who has passed on. And, uh, you know, I think it's just so much a part of our culture that it felt natural to do it in this book. Um, you know, I remember my mother died about two years ago and, um, not very long after I remember seeing somebody who asked me if, um, you know, if my mother had appeared to me yet. And, uh, you know, it's not really something that, um, you know, like my parents, you know, it, it wasn't a part of their practice, I should right. say. Um, so, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it in those terms, but it's, it's something that, you know, like people expect, um, you know, man. Perlene has that expectation, you know, and I think there is there too some of that sense of the the difference between the person who stays home and the person who goes away, or the person who is educated versus the person who um, I would I don't want to say isn't educated, but might be a little bit more steeped in 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 folklore and um, you know and African traditions. Mm -hmm. um, so there's at least one point in there where she talks about some of the traditions that, you know, people usually do after someone has died and, mm -hmm. you know, and missing some of those sorts of things. So, uh, you know, a lot of it really is, was just playing on, you know, what tradi general um, traditions that people have had that, you know, surrounding death and dying and uh, conversations with the dead. Right. I mean, I'm going to be honest. You say your mom passed away. I'm sorry about that. My, my father passed away. He comes to me in dreams still. So, you know, it's like they do still speak to you in different ways. In different ways like, right. Brown talk about recently, like when dimes show up, that's her mom's talking to her when she like finds dimes. They'll just show oh, up okay. randomly. It was something that her mom said to her before she passed away, something about dimes. So when she finds dimes, she knows that it's her mom. It's her mom. Oh, that's so, nice. You know, for some people, they go, oh, that's woo, kind of woo-woo. But I, I look at it in a lot of ways um, as a comfort, so to speak, to know mm -hmm. that, you know, the people who are no longer with us are still, they, they may not be with us in the physical, but they, they're, they're always here. So they're always here, right. I like being able to to see that and how you incorporated that within the story. Just, hey, these folks are talking to her and she's got some things to do because they're telling her right. <laughs> her things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think it's both the, the, the tradition and the culture, but it's also that sense of guilt too. You know, you've been charged with something. Um, are you doing it? Are you following through on what? has been asked of you. Um, and it could be, you know, in this case, it's this, you know, her father says, you are my memory. Um, mm -hmm. What is she going to do with that? Um, and, you know, that is her story. But I think for so many of us outside of, you know, fiction, it's, you know, what are we doing with our lives? Mm -hmm. What are we doing with what has been either passed down to us or given to us? Um, and, you know, is are you guilty or feeling guilt about what you're not doing? So mm -hmm. I think a lot of it, you know, plays in with 
with our real lives, with mm -hmm. the what we may or may not follow through on, what we may, you know, stories that we may just overlook for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. And thinking about uh, Rupert, who was the father, mm -hmm. um, it's like he was this person who desired this sense of freedom uh, and wanted to walk as a, as a proud, you know, human being. And some of the things that he did stems from that. And just looking at how some ways that could be a good thing <laughs> and sometimes maybe not so good in decisions or choices that were made. But, you know, also looking at how that impacted how Perlene showed up in the world and yeah. how she raised her daughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I look at it as, you know, the way we see it, the stories we tell ourselves that then form who we are and the people that we become. Um, and in some ways, that's the legacy that we keep passing down. Um, so one of the things that you will hear and, and see in this book is this idea of failure. Um, and, you know, like Perlene was afraid of failing. She didn't want to fail. Um, but a lot of that came back to what she thinks of her, of the story of her family mm -hmm. and just how that, you know, I kept, you know, being passed down. And, and then also plays into what she does for her daughter, how she, you know, reacts to or um, interacts with, with Derek. It's again, just this idea of this family legacy that you pass on from generation to generation or you let go of. Um, but, you, you know, I think just in general, even outside, of, again, outside of fiction, that there are things that we tell ourselves, you know, within our families or somebody might say to you, oh, you're lazy. And so that becomes the way you define yourself, whether you truly are lazy or not. Um, and, you know, it's just it's how we are as human beings. Right. right. And, you know, it's just something to think because oftentimes, like you said, this family thing, thinking of failure or we think of generational, quote unquote, curses. Like, oh, mm -hmm. my family is, you know, cursed with failure or cursed to do whatever X, Y, Z thing is. But to want to be that person that shifts things, that shifts the atmosphere. Right. And I, I I love that in this book that we that we see that that that's discussed like okay hey we can start to shift the atmosphere it does not have to be a certain way just because that's the way it's always been right yeah and and she tries I think her life in America was a part of that and when she goes back to Jamaica um, what she's trying to do is also shift that narrative um, change it do something other than what she thinks of as failure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And looking at, you know, just her parents and mm -hmm. you, ha you have this marriage, you know, they stayed married until, you know, death do us part, so to speak. <laughs> but you also see within that the context of marriage and how people can be married and have two very different ideas about life and what's important. Right. And hold it you know, hold it against the other without, while still staying together. And that is the part that I, I think is a little bit frightening sometimes that mm -hmm. you don't know, you may or may not know or may present to the world that everything is all well and good, but one person just holds something against the other. Um, and, you know, that's sort of what we see here. I, you know, don't want to say too much, nope. but, you know, you certainly <laughs> see it here. Um, and, and they do have two very different, two different views, mm -hmm. but I think, you know, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody, like I said, no spoilers, but just so you can know some of the, the, the meat you're going to get into, you know, when right. you read this book, it's yes, it's a story about Perlene and her journey, but there's a whole lot of, you know, other little pieces and things that are going on within the characters and the family just to see, you know, what's happening with them. Um, cause we, what we're not going to talk about is the secret about the house. Y'all got to read it to find that out. <laughs> There's 
some things about this house of, of plain truth. Well, we can talk about that because that's the name of the book. So what was it that um, the house of plain truth, what does that really stand for? Um, I, th I think it stands for, um, um, I don't know how to say this without saying okay. too much, but, um, but I, I think that there are things we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. There are things that we, um, and things that our family tells us. Mm -hmm. And that at some point you probably figure out, well, that's not exactly the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think in this case, the house is the, is the thing that helps you to understand what the truth is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And getting to the truth is so important because we think of all of the families that you know, may not be operating at an optimal level because of the secrets and, you yeah. know, not being truthful, honest about certain things that happen within their, you know, family structure. So, yeah, so y'all have to read it <laughs> to really get into to that. But I, you know, as the story goes on, we see a lot of things happening um, with Perlene. Um, one thing, she is a nurse. That's not saying too much. Mm -hmm. She is a nurse by trade. And that the differences between being in Jamaica and being in the United States, that kind of comes up. So how important was it for you to include that piece about the health and so people can understand about health care and how the systems are very different? Not that the one in the States is the greatest, but... <laughs> Um, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of, um, well, some of that came from just, you know, being, you know, in Jamaica and back and forth and seeing or getting to that age where you have, you know, like older relatives who are going through, you know, like health issues mm -hmm. and, you know, like there's so much to navigate. And if you're navigating it here, there is one set of challenges. And if you're navigating it in Jamaica, there's a completely different set of challenges that you're dealing with. Um, and, um, they're both challenging in their own way. But I think there is also just so much about the Jamaican healthcare system that, you know, is, you know, so much lacking in the Jamaican healthcare system, um, you know, for various reasons. But, you know, like if you're in a public hospital, there is a lot that you're going to have to take with you when you're going to that hospital, mm -hmm. as opposed to expecting, you know, that it's going to be provided there. And even if you're in a private hospital, it might be provided, but you're going to be paying for mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just basic things. So there, there is there in this in the book, um, you know, something that Perlene's sisters say that you know, if she gets sick in Jamaica, she can always leave, right, um, to come back to um, you know America to be treated. And you know, for a certain percentage of Jamaicans, that is indeed true. Mm -hmm. That you know, if you're, you know, if you a one are wealthy enough, or two, you have you know, dual citizenship. That is the reality. You can leave, you can get your treatment elsewhere, and you can go back. And then there are some people who really just have to struggle through, mm -hmm. um, you know, like trying to make do with what they have access to. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's the reality. So I think it was just one of those things that I wanted to. Um, not because I am making a point about healthcare. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, it's just a fact. It's, yeah. You know, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of your work does center Caribbean stories and Caribbean voices as you write them. So um, how um, important was it for you? Of course, you are Jamaican, so you want to tell parts mm -hmm. of your own story. But how important is it for you to make sure these particular types of stories get out into the world? become a part of the literary canon, so to speak? I mean, I think it is, it's it's important that we all tell our stories, um, regardless of where we are. And there are so many different pieces and perspectives. Um, there are things that I learn when I read stories from, you know, like whether it's somebody in Nigeria or Ghana, there are things that that person or perspectives that person will bring to, it could be the same circumstance, the same issue, but their perspective is going to be different. And it's the same with, um, you know, whether you're from Ohio or from Atlanta or from, you know, North Carolina, your circumstances, what you have experienced, what your family members have experienced 
will shape and change how you present that story to me. And I, I want to hear all of that. I really want to hear and see all of that, you know, that has been hidden from us. You know, right now I'm reading a book and each time I, I talk about this, um, I forget the title of the book, but I think it's called The Seven Moons of Almeida um, Somebody. But it's set in Sh Sri Lanka. Okay. And it's a, it's a story about a man who has died. And so he's a ghost. Um, he's, stu he's stuck in purgatory and he's trying to figure out how he died. Mm -hmm. And so most of the people who you meet in the story are also ghosts who are trying to, or who know how they have died, but who are, you know, looking at an, uh, at life. But one of the things that this book has done for me is has opened up um, a whole, you know, it goes through a lot of the history of Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. um, which I either don't know or didn't know just because of when it happened, I was probably not at the right age to be fully aware of what was happening then. But um, there's just so much history that mm -hmm. probably just isn't talked about, but it's presented in fiction in a way that makes it really engaging. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that all of us can do that regardless of where we are. And we can present and bring our own stories and make them just as interesting for people. And, you know, these are not, they don't necessarily have to be hard stories right. about, or about the difficult stuff, but, uh, you know, it's just your perspective. It's and and I think it matters. It helps all of us in so many different ways. I would agree, and that's why I wanted to have you here <laughs> because you know it is a a different story because you can see how can I how can I put it? You can see the differences in perhaps the way we may live or function in the world, but then you can also find the similarities. And, you know, that's what I really love about that. I want talking to women from across the diaspora and really be able to, to see that, to hear that in those stories or, you know, because I mean, it's, it, it's something as simple as our food. You know, we may eat the same things, but we're just preparing them differently. Right. right. And, yeah. and, you know, it came from somewhere. So there's, you know, there's a through line mm -hmm. that, you know, is amongst all of us. But, but then there are those things that are, are a little bit different. I can remember years ago reading Americana uh, when okay. it came out and kind of the same thing, seeing like, okay, you know, being from, I want to say it's Ghana and, you know, Nigeria. being in Nigeria, right. And being in America and what life looks like from that perspective. But then there are those things that are very similar. So mm -hmm. I really do appreciate you telling this story and folks, it's out next week. <laughs> so it's not too late to go ahead and pre-order a copy of The House of Plain Truth and, you know, really dive into this story and learn something about the history because I knew nothing about the whole Jamaica-Cuba connection. So that was, you know, a thing for me to learn and just to see, um, learn about the family and, and the different spaces that they were in and how they navigated that and the relationships and you know, all those things. Had someone here say, love the title. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it is a great title. It is a great title. So, um, and I'm going to throw something out real quick. If you have, if you don't have a copy and want to get one, it is available at the Brown Girl Collective Bookstore, um, which is listed there. And that goes directly to Bookshop. So if you're interested in picking up a copy, you can grab it there or any of your other retailers that you enjoy shopping with. And pre-orders are important when books haven't come out yet because that first week of sales is a big deal. That they are. <laughs> <laughs> Publish I mean, publishers look like to look at those numbers. And I think generally what it, it says is that one, there is interest and um, it helps them to, you know, like make some determinations. And bookstores also make determinations about what they will carry and you know how much they'll put behind um, a particular book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, is the book also going to be available in an audio? Yes, there is an audio and I, and an ebook format. I think um, audio for sure. I don't want to say anything about the ebook, but oh, well, that's good. That's good. Did you get a chance to select the person who reads the story? I did. That I did. Um, yeah, and you know, not every author has that opportunity, and I'm happy that in this case I did, 
have an opportunity to listen to the people who auditioned and to participate in the process of deciding who who did. Mm -hmm. So for those who get a chance to read The House of Plain Truth, what is one of the big things that you want them to take away from the story? You know, um, I think because so many people have said they never knew about the relation, the number of Jamaicans who had migrated, who had gone to Cuba to work. I think if this helps you to go on and read more and understand the dynamics between, um, you know, like migrants, you know, the, you know, things that happen or the experiences of migrants, whether they are, you know, going to Cuba, whether they are coming here to America or going or wherever it is in the world that you are, people who are coming into your country from another place. I think if it helps people to understand that or to step into somebody else's shoes and look at their circumstances, if that's all you get from it, it will make me very happy. Mm -hmm. I would say the, the biggest thing besides that for myself personally was just the relationships in the family and seeing, you know, the ebbs and the flows and mm -hmm. you know, people maybe, you know, not getting along as much as they could and, you know, watching how things shift. And when people sit down and start having conversations with one another and, right. you know, all of that and, and beginning to have a level of understanding because it, it's so easy in our relationships, familial or otherwise, to, you know, make up your mind about a person or a situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if it's based on past experience. Right. <laughs> There, there's always something that you don't know that if right. you take the time to really, you know, have conversations and, you know, um, be honest about what you're thinking and feeling that, right. you know, it can make a big difference. So that was another thing that I got right. out of just watching that family and mm -hmm. the dynamics within the family and, you know, how they were relating to one another over time. So. Right. But before we go, I mentioned it earlier on that you are the owner of the DC wow. Writers Room. So tell us what that is. I, I love the idea or concept of it. Yeah, it is a co-working studio for writers. So, um, you know, and it's open 24 seven. So if you are one of those writers who works at best at midnight and this is, you know, you need a space to work, this is somewhere that, you know, you can come to. And it's, it's really just a quiet space. I am one of those persons. I can't work in a coffee shop. I just need quiet mm -hmm. um, around me. And, um, you know, a place like the DC Writers Room is exactly that. It's um, the studio itself is really quiet. Nobody will disturb you. Um, unlike in a coffee shop where you, you know, you spread out, you probably can't leave your things there. Mm -hmm. You can get up, you know, you can move around because you're in a private space. So it's, um, you know, there are lots of writers there who work from, you know, whether fiction, poets, there are a couple of playwrights, um, you know, like some journalists, people doing a number of different things. So it's both a place to work, but also gives you an opportunity to, to meet with and to build a community um, of writers, if that's what you're interested in. Wow, that's really exciting. So what was it that prompted you to want to build a space like that, a community space? Well, I didn't start it. I can't take credit for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, another writer started it a few years back and then um, another writer purchased it from the original owner. Um, and, uh, you know, when she wanted to sell it, you, you know, I decided, well, you know, okay, well, this might be something that I can take on and, um, and try to build. And so I did. Um, but, you know, I, I think a large part of it is that it's nice to see people having a space and, you know, being able to create and work. And there are times when I don't feel like writing when I go and I, I'm there. I know that there are other people there working. I might just hear the little clicks of the computer and I know mm -hmm. I'm not alone. You know, right. there are other people going through some of the same struggles that I have. And it, it is actually inspiring in some ways. Right. That's one thing about writing. It, it is definitely, well, when you're in the thick of it, it's a, it's a solitary process. Mm -hmm. it ultimately isn't because, you know, you're dealing with editors and, you know, all these other things. Right. So, but you, when you're in the thick of it, I, I, I was watching um, someone on social media and they were saying, yeah, you spend a lot of time staring at a blank page or whatever the case may be. Exactly. Yeah. 
finding yeah. ways to go do something else when you really should be writing, all of that stuff. Right. So. Yeah, and that, that's the beauty of having a space like that. I'm not in my house. Um, the dishes in the sink will still be there. Mm -hmm. The, um, I, you know, I can, I don't have the TV to distract me, you know, so all of the, the distractions that are here are, are not there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thank you for doing that for the people in the DC area. And you say it's open 24 hours. So that's, that's really great. All right. Now with your writing, personal writing process, are you a person who gets up early to write or just whenever the the um, the muse strikes you or <laughs> um well my best time is in the morning oh. that's i know that and i tell myself that um i don't always get up mm -hmm. in the morning um but i aim to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and you know i think part of it too is that sometimes you you just have to do it when you can um, right regardless of what your preferred time is Mm-hmm. And um, do your characters kind of speak to you or or you tell them what to do or a combination? I think it's a combination, but I think when you start telling the characters what to do, it feels forced mm -hmm. and it's a very different, um, you end up with a very different product than when you let the story tell itself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I am not the kind of writer who, like, I don't outline. And I think a part of that process, part of that is because I I need to hear the story and see the story and and be in it as it is unfolding. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is tied in with the idea of of letting the story tell itself or letting the story go where it needs to go, as opposed to trying to direct it somewhere. Because mm -hmm. you can tell when a writer is directing a story in a certain direction, whether directing the characters or trying to force the plot you know, in a certain direction, because it doesn't feel like it's organic to the story. It just feels forced upon the story. Mm -hmm. And as you're saying, it's something in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of like nowadays, you see a lot of stories being written where people are doing a formula. Yeah, yeah, there is, yeah. Um, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, no, I would say one thing about um, The House of Plain Truth, it does not feel like a form, a formulaic <laughs> type of book. So I, I love that because sometimes it's like, okay, well, I know this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. I might not know all the details, but you kind of, you know, you kind of know the story before you've had an opportunity to even finish it. So right. that's the only thing I can say The House of Plain Truth is not that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the beauty of writing like this. It, you know, it 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 goes where it needs to go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as um, just in um, line with the title, someone made a comment. Uh, where is it? One of the hugest hurdles for families is plain truth. So that's what makes this story <laughs> so great. <laughs> Indeed. It's, it's Indeed. Being to get to that so of course the book is going to be released on next tuesday the third the 30th mm -hmm. and do you have any particular events or anything that you'd like to tell folks about that they can either meet you in person or you know join you in other online forums or anything like that yeah absolutely on january 30th i'll be at politics and prose um, in dc on Conne in the connecticut avenue store at 7 p.m i think um on um Wednesday, I'll be in Baltimore at Bird in Hand, and I believe that's at 6 p.m. And on Thursday, I will be in New York. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, right, so in New York at Center for Fiction, I think that's at 7 or so. And the following week, I'll be in L.A. at Zippy Bookshop. Um, I think that's Monday, I think. But it's the following week, February 5th or 6th. Oh, wow. um, so, so yeah, there are a lot of ad, um, events coming up. And also on February 12th, I'll be in Miami. So if you are in any of those areas, um, please come see me. Right. Definitely do that. And Donna's information has been scrolling in terms of Instagram and her website probably is the best place to go to get all of that information and keep up with the things that she is doing um, as far as the promotions for the House of Plain Truth. And I'm going to ask it, even though a lot of people don't want to talk about it, <laughs> but are you working on anything new? 
because a lot of times by the time this one's out, you already got something else in the back. So <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the beauty about um, my process is that I, I seem to have a book that I have been working on for some time. And, you know, like I have another novel that I had started some years ago, which I finally figured out exactly how to tell that story. So that is almost done. Hopefully it will be done very soon. And, um, and then I have another idea beyond that, that I just have maybe a page of, but I think it can become something. So there's always something in the back of my mind. I love that. Just a little seed of an idea. <laughs> I, I, and I, I like the fact that you say that you kind of take your time. You're not trying to rush to, to the finish line. You take your time and let the story kind of grow and develop and, you know, to be able to tell it that way. I, I, I can appreciate that because I think we live in a time where people just want to rush, rush, rush to get stuff out. And yeah. 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 I remember some years ago, somebody told me that once a book is published, it can't be unpublished. And I've never forgotten that. You know, it's so I take my time to tell the story that I want to tell and not tell something that I'm going to regret. Mm -hmm. Good advice for all you writers out there. Don't tell something you might regret. <laughs> that, that is good advice and, and, and a great way to uh, finish up. So Donna, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and your energy and the House of Plain Truth. I'm gonna have to go back and read some of the other things and be on the lookout for what you have um, forthcoming as well, because I think you you have a, a, a beautiful voice, you know, and it's good to really be able to hear your voice and hear these different stories from the Caribbean and beyond. So thank you and I appreciate you for doing what you do. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. And I appreciate your kind words. Oh, not a problem. So if you don't hang up on me yet, hold on. <laughs> I wanna announce what's happening next week, but I don't want you to hang up just yet. So um, just hold on for one second. Mm -hmm. I'll let you get some water or whatever you need to do. <laughs> and uh, someone saying, thank you. You're welcome, Ruby. And then I will be back to you in two seconds. Okay. All righty. So everyone, wasn't that a great conversation? I really loved having a chance to talk to Donna. And as I already mentioned, please go out and, you know, grab a copy, pre-order, whatever you need to do to get the House of Plain Truth in your hands. It is a, 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 a book you can read you know, over the course of a weekend or whatever. Just really dive into the story and, um, you know, enjoy what she's talking about and learn some things along the way. So by means of announcement, what is happening a week from today, we will have Rashonda Tate with us to talk about the Queen of Sugar Hill, which is a fictionalized account of the life of Hattie McDaniel, the first black woman to win an Academy Award. So we're going to be diving into that a week from today, uh, which is, I believe, the 29th of January. And actually next week, we're going to get two BGC book club um, events. Normally on Wednesday, I do like a Live Well Sister, but next week it's going to be two BGC book club events. And the one on Wednesday, we'll be talking about Black Voices, Inspiring and Empowering Quotes from Global Thought Leaders by Jessica Ann Mitchell. I, I we are, so forgive me, Sister, if I messed it up, I'll get it right by next week. But yes, we'll be talking about this, which is a beautiful book full of quotes and just things about Black um, thought leaders. And I thought that would be a good way to segue into Black History Month, which will be the following day. So look for those two next week on the 29th and the 31st. And soon and very soon, I'll be announcing all of the wonderful authors um, that we will have joining us in the month of February. So um, with that being said, I bid to bid you all adieu, and we will see you again here in the next week. Take really good care of yourselves. Talk soon. Bye-bye.